Good evening. My name is Lynn Gates, and I'm the vice chair of Canadian Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. And it's my great pleasure to be introducing two clinicians who are going to speak about um, surgical and, and liver-directed uh, treatments for neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Janice Pasika. She graduated from the University of Western Medical School and had, did her general surgery training at the University of Calgary. She then did two and a half years of endocrine surgical training. The first year was spent in Dr. David Hanley's lab at the University of Calgary, then a year at the University of Michigan under the mentorship of Dr. Norman Thompson, followed by time at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. She then returned to Calgary and has devoted her clinical practice solely to endocrine surgical diseases. At the Tom Baker Clinic Center, Dr. Pasika was the driving force behind the development of a multidisciplinary clinic for neuroendocrine tumors, as well as the multidisciplinary hereditary endocrine clinic. She is responsible for the development of the only Canadian American Association of Endocrine Surgeons accredited fellowship program in endocrine surgery. After Dr. Pasika's presentation, we'll be hearing from Dr. Calvin Law. Dr. Calvin Law is a surgical oncologist at the Odette Cancer Center, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Dr. Law's clinical practice is devoted to hepatobiliary, pancreatic, and gastrointestinal malignancies, and he has a subspecialized practice in neuroendocrine tumors. As the co-founder of the Susan Leslie Multidisciplinary Neuroendocrine Tumors Clinic, Dr. Law is actively engaged in the treatment of patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Dr. Law has served in numerous leadership roles and currently is the chief of the Odette Center, Cancer Center and regional vice president for Cancer Care Ontario. Thank you. Dr. Pasika? Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. Um, and uh, just a confirmation that you're seeing my slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, the management, surgical issues. And before I start, um, I realize that CNET's being a, a patient advocacy group that many on the uh, webinar are probably patients or are um, significant other uh, of the patients that are suffering from neuroendocrine tumors. And Really, uh, the survivorship issues that patients uh, dealing with neuroendocrine uh, tumors are quite complex. And uh, when we look at survivorship issues, we're really looking at, uh, as a, a complex uh, integration of one's physical health, mental health, and social health. And all of these factors will impact on that. And what we do as clinicians in the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors truly does have an impact on your survivorship, mainly on the physical and the mental health. And I think that it's uh, important for the clinicians that take care of patients with neuroendocrine tumors to constantly be aware of the, this uh, complex um, uh, issues when we uh, propose a treatment plan uh, for these rare um, tumors. These are my disclosures. I sit on a few advisory boards. I will disclose that when we go through the data, I mean, there's limited data on neuroendocrine uh, patients. Um, that's because it is a rare tumor, but that is changing as more and more are, of us are studying this. And I will uh, disclose that I am a surgeon, so most of my talk will be very surgically biased. Uh, and uh, for any medical oncologist out there, you'll recognize it right away. My objectives are going to hopefully leave you with an appreciation of the complexity of the surgical management of neuroendocrine tumors. Recognize that there's a changing paradigm in the oncological surgical therapy of neuroendocrine tumors and to understand the role that the surgeon plays, the important role that the surgeon plays in the treatment of these uh, tumors. 
When I think of the surgical management of neuroendocrine tumors, I divide it in this way, curative, preventative, prognosticating, and palliative. Really sort of the C3PO objectives. And we're gonna go through each of these and show you some examples of where surgery plays a, a crucial role. But first, I think uh, as many who have been to centers that have multidisciplinary clinics, you recognize that the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors is not a, uh, a sole person running the ship. Patients come to us through by the surgeons, the endocrinologists, uh, by a medical oncologists, and this group then goes about trying to make the diagnosis. And this is based on the clinical hallmarks of the tumor, but we depend very much on uh, laboratory uh, investigations and expertise, pathological expertise, radiographic expertise, GI intervention and expertise, and a dedicated cardiologist. And once we then have the diagnosis and have all these players involved in putting their two cents worth into what's going on with the patient, we look at the treatment options that are available and we try our best to base it on evidence-based medicine. And that those options may involve medical therapy, surgical therapy, combination of both. And once we impart uh, on some therapy, we then have to be cognizant of measuring our outcomes and feeding that back into the evidence-based um, uh, literature. And our outcomes in neuroendocrine tumors are looking at the palliative response to our treatment modalities, the quality of life for the patient, progression-free survival, disease-free survival, and any morbidity or mortality that intervention will um, impart on the patient. In 1998, uh, we established a, a multidisciplinary neuroendocrine a tumor here in Calgary and really recognized uh, very early on that once we had the diagnosis and, and the workup, that the sur surgery played the um, pinnacle role and the first step in the management. And we would look at these patients and see if we could completely resect the tumor. And if we could, then we would then follow these patients. But most times we were faced with unresectable disease or we would take on a strategy of cytoreducing, decreasing the tumor burden um, of that disease. Now, when we first started, uh, we were liaised with the University of Alberta. So our asymptomatic patients, we then, after we would send them up for uh, PRT therapy, which was MIBG, uh, and then transition to lutetium. If they had an endocrinopathy, we would start them on octreotide, then also look for PRT therapy. And then we would look at the tumor response. Partly because of what's happening in the literature and what we've learned about the disease uh, and also re resource management, now our asymptomatic patients are put on a somatostatin analog, um, even if they don't have an endocrinopathy. And PRT therapy is really being utilized when we start to see progression. So we're looking at various ways, surgical um, and our uh, uh, somatostatin analogs and see how the tumor behaves before we trigger PRT. Another way of looking at this disease, this is a, a little cartoon that um, was presented probably about 15 years ago uh, in which, uh, or maybe, maybe even longer, in which um, one of the, the experts at Nanets was saying, well, if you have a neuroendocrine tumor, as the disease progresses, First, you do surgery, and then the role of surgery in liver-directed therapies decreases proportionally as chemotherapy and PRT therapy increase. And somatostatin analogs were not started initially. They were only started once we saw, saw progression. Well, we just didn't believe that and didn't practice that in our own clinic. Surgery was still very much up front. 
We started a lot of patients on somatostatin analogs from the beginning, and we followed this trend, but then there came a point when our systemic therapies were starting to fail, and we re-looked at other ways of addressing uh, the disease surgically or cytoreducing it, and then go feeding back into targeted or PRT therapy. We also then started developing a real sense that the end of life issues in patients suffering from metastatic neuroendocrine tumor are quite different than those of the traditional adenocarcinomas and developed expertise in this area. So let's look at the uh, curative, preventative, prognosticating and palliative uh, surgical interventions. So we do have the ability surgically to cure uh, neuroendocrine tumors. That means getting an R0 resection, removing all visible and known diseases removed, and the patient is then disease-free. And we do that in patients with benign insulinomas, we can do it in small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and we can do that when uh, incidentally discovered lesions such as those in the appendix. Unfortunately, for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, we haven't really gotten uh, the ability, um, mainly because when the patients present to us, their disease has already moved from the primary in the bowel into uh, the um, uh, lymph nodes and maybe beyond that. And you can see that when we looked at the prog prognosis of small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, when it was thought that they were all in the small bowel, the five-year survival many years ago was still only 75%, meaning there was patients that we thought we had a curative resection, but they were recurring. And in 2011, the French published their series and showed that 42% of patients with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors following a curative resection recurred uh, when followed over 10 years. We also know that patients that present with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, anywhere from 20 to as high as 60% will have disease in their liver at the time of presentation, and almost 80% have lymph node involvement. We, in our own series, found that even with uh, uh, imaging modalities preoperatively, we were finding 16% of patients have liver disease, very small volume, when um, all imaging modalities were negative. And this is the paper that I'm talking about. When we looked at CT, MRI, MIVG, octreotide scans, you can see when we brought those patients to the OR, we found more mesenteric or lymph node disease. We found more disease in the liver and 25% had peritoneal disease when only 6% did we have that inclination on our imaging. Now, all this will likely change and we're going to have to redo this study when we uh, look at gallium uh, PET scanning, as this is a much more sensitive modality for showing us the extent of disease. Well, what about preventative? Surgery can be preventative in two types of uh, neuroendocrine tumors, those of what we call type 1 gastric carcinoids and small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Gastric carcinoids type 1 are usually found on upper endoscopies uh, as an incidental finding. They tend to be very small. They can be treated endoscopically, so resected with the uh, upper endoscopy with an excellent survival, and it's only when they're very large do they actually show a malignant potential. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we're starting to see more of these with cross-sectional imaging being done for other reasons. And when it is incidentally found, so we find a small, less than two centimeter pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor for somebody that presents, let's say, with abdominal pain uh, on a CET or MRI, the chances of that being malignant is only 4%. So in these small lesions, we can be preventative uh, if picked up incidentally. What about prognosticating? Well, this is uh, when, again, so what does uh, surgery play a role here? Well, here we can then predict which of the patients that 
we find an incidental lesion in the appendix or in the rectum that we uh, have completely cured with a local resection. And the reason that we can prognosticate in these two diseases is when neuroendocrine tumors appear in the appendix or in the rectum, they're size dependent. So the smaller they are, the less likely they have of spread. So we find neuroendocrine tumors in the appendix in up to 0.3% of all appendectomies that are done. They tend to be very small, and when they are under a centimeter in size, the risk of going to the lymph nodes is actually close to 0%. So these can be easily treated and completely treated with the appendectomy. When they get over two centimeters in size, up to 30% will have lymph node involvement. And because we don't know that at the time of the appendectomy, we would recommend a right hemicolectomy, taking out more of the area around the appendix and the lymph nodes to find out if the patient is the 70 to 80 percent chance that they have been completely cured with the append appendectomy alone or whether they fall into this group of patients that needs to be followed in a multidisciplinary neuroendocrine clinic. The ones in between, we look at other pathological factors, and that's why if you are one of those patients, we tend to have these reviewed by our pathologist to see if there's any clues that this may be one of those lesions that has now gone beyond just the appendix. The same happens with rectal carcinoids. These are being seen at an increased frequency because of screening colonoscopies or maybe because of rectal bleeding. And again, they're size dependent. So when they're small and under a centimeter, the risk of lymph nodes is uh, less than 7%. So most of these can be excised locally without a big uh, rectal um, resection. But once they get over two centimeters, they do need uh, a what we call a, a a uh, total measles uh, uh, excision, meaning they do need a um, an oncological procedure of removing the rectum. Finally, palliative. So what, what can surgery do when the disease in the liver is so extensive that there's no surgical option to debulk it, or the disease in the mesentery is encasing um, major vessels, or it's gone beyond just the abdomen? Well, surgery still plays an important role, and that's because we've had this paradigm shift. Surgery uh, in oncological tumors was, if we can't resect it all to improve survival, then surgery is not the option. But in neuroendocrine tumors, because of the endocrinopathy that many of these tumors produce, if we can get better symptom control, we can provide better palliation, and we've been showing that we can then help with the stability of the disease. So we really look at patients that have extensive disease in trying to improve their quality of life versus the quantity of life. We want to decrease their symptoms. And if that means doing a surgery because of small bowel ischemia or carcinoid syndrome, decrease the hormone production by debulking or cytoreducing the tumor so there's less hormones that'll protect the heart, it may help with the carcinoid syndrome, and then decreasing the tumor burden because maybe that'll help with other therapies such as PRT, chemo, or targeted therapies. There's a lot that's being written now about uh, going after the primary tumor. Um, this is a very provocative article written by the Uppsala Group, uh, other recently that has a lot of us, you know, rethinking and looking at this critically because many of the times the tumor in the small bowel is very tiny, but what it can do is cause a lot of liver disease and these do not cause obstruction. So if they're asymptomatic, do we really have to take the primary out? And the important thing about this paper was that this was for patients that were completely symptomatic. 
because prior to that paper, the real guidelines were telling us and, and what many of us practiced was that we should go after the primary even in the face of liver disease because it seemed to be when we resected the primary that they had a better median progression-free survival. When the primary was taken, it was 56 months versus 25. And the mean survival was also improved. And many of us, many were postulating that the primary that's in the small bowel was putting out some propagating factors that were causing these liver metastases to grow faster and therefore taking it out had some advantage. Uh, this is from the Royal Free that demonstrated that it was an independent predictor of survival. So we're debating that if you're completely asymptomatic from the primary, we don't always uh, rush in and take it out if we, um, but if we're going in there because of the liver disease, then the primary should come out at the same time. A lot of the times we're going in because of this mesenteric disease. This is uh, the small lesions can cause a lot of lymph node uh, disease that has this what we call desmoplastic reaction, a very dense inflammatory reaction around the lymph node. And what that can cause is kinking of the bowel. It can then cause ischemia of the bowel or a combination of both. And those patients are symptomatic not necessarily with carcinoid syndrome, but they're having abdominal pain and intermittent obstructions. And taking their primary out in their mesenteric disease is important. And this is again the Uppsala group that demonstrated aggressive uh, local regional uh, disease, going after that mesenteric disease, even in the face of liver metastases, tended to improve survival versus those in which we could not resect. And then that just recently published is this multi-center trial from the United States, um, about almost 200 patients, and they demonstrated a survival benefit when at least eight, eight or more lymph nodes were then taken out with the specimen. And that's just a demonstration of getting a good lymph node clearance and then being able to then uh, prognosticate better because they found if less than four of those uh, lymph nodes were positive, that proved to be a better prognosis than those that had greater than four. So what that tells me is that it is important for surgeons when they're going after this disease that they do an oncological resection, capturing as many lymph nodes as they can safely. So surgery for the small bowel will improve the quality of life. Many uh, studies have shown it improves symptoms, delays the onset of ischemia and small bowel obstruction. Then that leads us to the hepatic disease. And the hepatic disease is where a lot of the hormones are being produced that cause the syndromes. And so if we can reduce the um, the tumors and decrease the endocrinopathy, de have a biochemical response, we will improve symptoms and provide better palliation. And there's many ways about doing that. And uh, I'm now going to then turn it over to one of the experts here in Canada, Dr. Calvin Law, who has really spent his career looking at ways of liver directed therapies. So I'll turn it over to you, Calvin. Thanks. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, I'm going to see what I can do here to, oh, there we go. Let's say. Hi, sorry. Um, okay, I'm hoping you guys can see my screen. I've been having a little bit of trouble tonight. I apologize. Um, 
Hopefully that's coming mm -hmm. through. So, guys, thanks. I, uh, you know, I, I realized we didn't have that much time, so I've really compressed this. And I thought um, your pictures of liver resections were excellent. I was really focusing on the liver-directed therapies, but I think we can combine a lot of this uh, this evening. Um, I think we can combine a lot of this this evening in our discussion. And uh, I think you've brought up the really good points. I think the very, the very important thing that everybody should remember is that there is no straightforward answer for each and every one of you. There should be a fairly customized plan. Um, there are some unique characteristics, and I think that we're uh, there's a lot to learn. And the other dimension that you have to realize for all these therapies is there. there's, there's a sequence and it's not going to be the same for everybody, which makes it hard, um, especially in a wonderful group like CNETS where you get to talk to each other. Sometimes I try to remind everybody not to be frustrated if you don't have exactly the same treatment as somebody else. Um, now, the uh, Dr. Sieg already showed some things. This is a uh, uh, sort of an example or a classification presented by one of our colleagues named Frilling from England uh, a few years ago that we, we tend to use. Um, and it's always a little scary to look at this, but it really is not meant to be scary. There are treatments for each and they're different and the scenarios are very, very different. Um, the first type, uh, which is uh, we call a type one um, uh, here, uh, usually involves a, a, a group a generally large tumor um, with a lot of the liver pr preserved. So you have a lot of what we call fairly normal looking liver and there's a very dominant area of liver metastasis. And this is, this is the typical scenario where we would in fact um, push more towards surgical resection because there's such a good preservation of the rest of the liver. The other extreme is the type three on this side. And uh, one of the challenges here uh, that, that you can see is that there's quite diffuse disease. So there's lots of little spots and they're kind of spread out through the entire liver. And uh, you know, there's no really easy way for us to uh, excise all of this surgically and still leave enough functioning liver or undamaged liver for somebody to be happy about it after the surgery. So this is a different situation. And I do certainly want to spend more of my time talking about that, given that um, Dr. Psyche has spent already a lot of time talking about surgery. And then you have this in-between. The in-between is where there is still a fair amount of what, what we would call preserved liver, uh, but there are areas that are quite involved. And then there are satellite areas that are less involved. So it's a bit of a mix. Instead of a full pattern all the way across, where uh, there's diffuse involvement of the liver. Now you have a bit of a mix. There's areas where there's diffuse involvement and there's areas where there's less than diffuse involvement. And in this situation that you can do a combination of things. And I, I think the main thing to emphasize here is why it's hard for each and every person to just sort of think that they should have the same treatment as the person beside them. Um, on top of this, uh, these images are just the anatomic appearance of these tumors. Some of them will make an excess of hormones, such as serotonin, which many of you are familiar with, that cause carcinoid syndrome with flushing and diarrhea. But some of them do not, um, because there are non-functional tumors, which can come from the pancreas, for example, and other areas. They're all neuroendocrine tumor, but they can behave quite differently. And hopefully, well, we can go through some of this as we go through um, the, uh, our discussion this evening. So when we say liver-directed therapies, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to focus a little bit on non-surgical approaches because surgery it, it, we can bring back in a little later, but what happens when you are thinking about trying to address people's metastatic neuroendocrine tumor to their liver without an operation? And generally, um, the approach that we take here is by using an advantage of the way the liver blood, blood flow is and the way these neuroendocrine tumors spread there. They tend to go to the liver and then they tend to drive their blood supply from a an, uh, from an vessel called the hepatic artery. Um, and that is actually fairly unique because most of the liver is supplied by another blood vessel. We're gonna, we're gonna show you this and then we're gonna try and see if you, you can understand. So this is the unique aspect of the, um, of the liver flow in a, in a diagram, if I can show it. Um, 
when when we talk about arteries, we generally talk about blood flowing out of away from the heart and to the other organs. And we often think of this as very rich oxygenated blood, which it is. Um, this blood is coming back from the lung after the lung has filled the blood with oxygen. And as it goes and as it goes through these organs and kind of gives off its oxygen, it starts to return to the heart, and that's the veins. And the thinking it generally is that the veins carry a little less oxygen, and they do in terms of total concentration, um, because they're going back, they've already delivered the oxygen, they're going back to the heart to, to where it pumps back to the lung, regains oxygen again, and continues on. Well, the issue here is, interestingly, the liver um, actually derives most of its oxygen from this lower oxygen-containing venous flow. That is, this is, this is the blood that's coming back from the entire digestive system. The reason that happens is because the liver is the filter for your digestive system. It detoxifies things, it, it, um, it picks up whatever you eat and processes it. So all the blood flow coming from your digestive system is going through here. Now, parts of your liver still receive blood from the, um, this artery called the hepatic artery, and they kind of mix in the liver. They don't join quite like this, but some parts of your liver require very oxygen-rich blood, and then most of the liver just requires this other blood that's coming from the portal vein, we call it. And that doesn't need as high concentration of oxygen, but it's still, it is most of the flow in the liver. The unusual thing is that when you look here, this is how the liver is made up if you go down to the parts. But, um, and sorry, I was originally going to use my iPad to draw here, but uh, I, I can't. But I'm going to try my best to do a few things. The um, when you look in, in this situation, there's the vein, the portal vein, which can, which gives the liver most of its flow, and there's the hepatic artery, which only feeds some of it. But when you're in, when your endocrine tumor spread, let's say it comes here, and when it does that, something very unique happens in that these neuroendocrine tumors require a lot than the regular liver cells. So it's going to start stealing blood from the hepatic artery, and it starts to to do that. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we can see it on scan on CT scans. Uh, many of you have had a ton of CT scans, probably more than any of you would have wished. And you wonder uh, why do they always put that dye in me? Well, part of the reason is that we can light up and see these neuroendocrine tumors spread to the liver because they're stealing blood from the hepatic artery. And depending on the timing of when you take the picture, uh, so some, some of you have gone through the CT scan, you kind of hear that they start, you kind of go through the ring, and then you kind of go through it again. Well, one is when the dye is going through the artery, and the other is when the dye is going through your veins. So there's a couple of sequences, and the one going through the artery can sometimes show these uh, lesions. But it also means that because it is taking blood from here, this is actually, to us, a little bit of a weakness. And why we mean that is because we can deliver therapies in this artery while not disturbing the vein. And thus, we can potentially keep all your normal liver cells alive while we deliver a therapy that's just going to affect um, the neuroendocrine cells. So, that is what we want to talk about. The other thing that's unique about the liver, and I showed you a little bit about it, is earlier when I showed you how they spread, well, the liver is not one block. It's actually probably about at least eight. Some of you have more, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, but there's, there's actually eight different segments of the liver, and they're all based on where these branches are. If you look, there's these branches, and these branches, um, define individual blocks of the liver. Now, this is a further advantage because it means that if we could get in there, if we could get to an individual artery, we can treat sections of the liver at a time. So we can treat a specific artery and a specific section. So we can be very, very specific. So if you had, for example, a tumor here and a tumor in seven, but let's say two, three, four is okay, you can actually treat just seven and just eight um, and try to minimize the treatment effects on the other parts of the liver. Now, you can definitely do that with surgery. When you saw Dr. Pasika's pictures earlier, you saw an example she showed where the just this tumor was removed and just this tumor was removed. But if you were in the type three situation I showed and you had a spot 
in all these segments. Um, and it is, not, and you know, as a surgeon, let's say we, there was some reason why we could not you know, technically remove all of these spots. Well, the interesting thing is with embolization, we can treat them, not all at the same time, because that would be too much for the liver, but you can go and you can do seven and six first, and then you can do eight and five next, you can do four and two, three, maybe. So there's different variations that we can do to take advantage of your natural anatomy and the way these tumors sort of involve themselves in the liver. Now, the other neat thing is that we can get into those little vessels uh, using a, a wire and the wire can go uh, from your groin, but nowadays, uh, most of the time, we go through your wrist, uh, which seems amazing, but we can go through the artery in the wrist and uh, believe it or not, find our way um, all the way to the liver. Now, this is very similar, if any of you have ever had to unfortunately have to have what they call a, an angiogram, which is of the heart, which happens when you have heart disease. Um, they put a little wire usually in the groin and they, they kind of put dye into the heart so they can see the heart vessels. Well, you can do the same thing um, in, a, in a weird kind of way. The wire has to take a, a turn to the right side of your body rather than straight up. And so if you take a right turn, you end up into the liver. And once you're into the liver, then you have the advantage of starting to access each of those individual branches of the hepatic artery to help um, see if you can uh, give treatment there. Now, um, I'm gonna try and see if I can um, show you. Now, here's what it would typically look like. If I can show you on this video, this is what it looks like when we start. So we put in, we there's the little catheter coming in here. Um, and that cath, I don't know if you can see my uh, my pointer here, but this, this um, let's see, this, this uh, wire right here going in is actually coming from the wrist and then it's getting into, this is the main aorta and then we're turning into the liver. And um, as, as we do that, uh, we are, um, what, what we're showing you is then we start filling the artery with dye. So that's the dye that's going in and we can see. Now, as, you, as, you, as the dye flows through, there's all the liver mats. Boom, boom, boom. They are tiny little, they're feeding off of this artery. And this little flushing that you see is really uh, a representation of the small blood vessels that it's trying to steal uh, from the hepatic artery. And the cool thing is that we now, like this is how we've known that they have this weird kind of blood supply stealing from one only one artery where the liver is sort of feeding from both. And it's because of tests like this. Now, once you're in there, you can actually then inject therapy. And the classic therapy that we would inject is tiny little microspheres. And what they're done, what they're designed to do is that they're sized to go into these little tiny blood vessels. So if those, uh, again, if these are the size of the blood vessels, these little, little flushing areas here, if those are the areas that we're targeting with treatment, we already know based on studies we've done before, what the size of those arteries are. So we can actually then, um, they, we can actually then inject another run, which is you're gonna see here uh, of those little particles. And it basically gets rid of those spots and, and the spots start to disappear. Uh, but, you, but you still maintain the blood flow to most of the liver. But if you size the particles right, and then you aim it right, uh, again, you flow them in and you start what we call it, it's like pruning a tree, we call it. We start pruning out all those little blood vessels in the distance and you have far less spots uh, by the time you're finished. So that is what embolization does. And again, the important part of it is that you can do one segment at a time um, and you, you can be quite creative about the way these treatments go. Now, no matter what, the issue is, and what's different between this kind of treatment and surgical resection, is that although you don't get a cut, and that's nice, and you don't have post-surgical pain, and that's nice, um, please remember we are killing tissue inside of you. We are literally taking the blood supply out of these and, and killing the tumor, which is what we want. The only problem is as tissue dies in you, you can imagine your body doesn't really like it. In fact, the strange thing is that your body's immune system, which may have not totally recognized this tumor earlier, well, it recognizes dead tissue. So if you cut off the blood supply and, and these tumor tissue dies, 
you can get a quite an immune response. And that's often called post-embolization syndrome, which is really the most common side effect. And you'll feel fever and you can have some nausea. There's definitely pain in the right upper side and you may not feel like eating for some time. It doesn't usually happen right away, but the day after to the week after is the most common time it happens. And this sensation can last a few days, sometimes, unfortunately, a few weeks. But the only good thing I can say is that it's much more common on the first embolization and usually the subsequent uh, embolizations after that is a little better. Not always, but a little better. And obviously, the more the likelihood of this happening is going to depend on how much tumor we're targeting and how much of your liver we're targeting. So again, we have to custom design it for you. Some people need two embolizations only. Some people need 10 embolizations. It just depends on what we can address in one day. Now, aside from this, and we'll go into more, there are some other serious but less common side effects. You can get infections of some kind. Obviously, you've got to be make sure that um, you don't hurt the liver too much or the liver goes into either some sort of liver failure. Um, bleeding can happen. Bleeding can also happen from where the wire goes in. So you, you often have to stay with us overnight while we put some compression where we put the wire in. Um, if the tumor is too big, remember that first picture I showed you with a very large tumor, if you try to kill something like that off, it might have so much tissue that died that you actually have a more serious version of this syndrome called tumor lysis syndrome. Final thing is something called cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver. Most of us might have seen this word if we talk about people that have drank too much and have liver disease, but it can also happen over time uh, with repeated uh, applications of embolization. So you do have to continuously check the liver after you've given treatment to make sure that you don't see developing signs of the scarring. Now, there are some issues for people. They, not everyone can just have this. For sure, I've mentioned cirrhosis is a complication, but if you already have cirrhosis, then um, that, might, that might be a reason why we can't offer you this therapy. We have to be very careful about it. Sometimes people have had surgery for various reasons. It doesn't always have to be cancer surgery. It may have been a bad stone or some other problem you've had in the past where the bile duct, which is uh, one of the the, the, the pipe that carries the bile that the liver makes is directly connected to the bowel. And if you've had that surgery before, it might mean that uh, the embolization would be challenging. If you have a contrast dye allergy, that's going to be a problem. If your kidney is not in good shape, that's a problem. Some of you uh, will have arteries that are coming from different places. So that, that can be, make it very hard for us to get the little uh, wire into place. And finally, if you have a lot of atherosclerosis, which is like calcium deposits in your artery, and we can't get the wire through, that can be another problem. So there are some, some things. We can get around a lot of it, uh, but it, there are just some things that you have to consider. Now, I'm just going to show you one study. This was a multi-center combination of a lot of experience looking at uh, larger burdens of liver disease, at least over 25% of, of the liver involved. And I don't think that this is the whole answer, but it gave us some interesting thoughts. It did say that people who had a lot of functional syndrome, so let's say carcinoid syndrome and were symptomatic, they often did better with surgery. They definitely got benefit using uh, embolization or liver-directed therapy, but maybe not as much if they used only liver-directed therapy alone compared to surgery. However, if you were trying to control tumor uh, that wasn't necessarily creating a lot of hormone, the benefits of the surgery over embolization were less clear. We do think that it helped people, but in this case, actually, maybe embolization is equivalent. So there's a lot to think about and talk about when you use this. And the situations, like I said, from the an anatomic variation to whether it's producing a lot of chemical or not, can play a big uh, role in the decision making. Finally, believe it or not, we're learning more and more every day. There's different types of embolization. The most commonly used is this thing called bland embolization. And I don't know why they picked that word bland. It's, uh, you know, who would ever choose an option that's called bland? But anyways, what it means is that they are just particles and they don't have anything fancy associated with it. Um, it is the safest. It definitely works. Um, and it has fairly good effect. It can last over a year. Lipidol is actually poppy seed oil, and it's been used in other tumors to, uh, in addition to the, uh, the bland embolization, and it seems to increase the time of effect. 
And the most uh, recent thing that we're using is called drug eluding beads. So now you're combining bland, which are those beads, but you have special chemotherapy attached to it um, uh, so that uh, the, uh, uh, the chemotherapy is actually attached to the beads. So when the beads go into the tumor and start to starve it of oxygen, it actually also delivers a molecule of chemotherapy. And in fact, that is currently a trial we're participating in as along with other centers. It's actually led by our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, believe it or not. And, uh, but we're all, we're all uh, participating to try and ensure that the wider we go, the larger number of centers we do, and the larger number of patients we include, um, the better we'll learn and the more we can advance the state of the art. I certainly have a lot of hope for this. Our early results look promising, but again, it's a trial that uh, I hope we can report on uh, soon uh, in the future. So as we finish up here, I mean, the question a lot of people is, what is it right for me? I think that We've talked a little bit about it. We, there's a matrix. I want you to be patient with us sometimes when we talk to you in clinic and can be very overwhelming. And sometimes it looks like we keep making different decisions, but there is a matrix to how we fit this in. It is, I think liver directed therapy should be part of any management decision. It's definitely can be used to control uh, syndromes where surgery isn't possible, but it's also used to complement surgery. You can use it before surgery. You can use it after surgery. But you have to use it thoughtfully and you have to have your team uh, uh, plan for it because there is a total number of embolizations in a lifetime that each person can tolerate. Some people can tolerate a whole lot more. Some people can tolerate a whole lot less. But if we can fit it in part of your plan thoughtfully, then hopefully you won't need to come anywhere close to the total number of embolizations that you can um, tolerate. Finally, here's, here's an example of how, just a very quick one that, that can help illustrate the complexities of this. Uh, one of our 55 year old patients, she came in with severe diarrhea and flushing. She had over a hundred small liver mats uh, spread throughout her whole liver. And also as Dr. Kazika told in her example, she still had her small bowel tumor because this is how it was discovered. Now the small bowel tumor wasn't blocking her yet. So we had some time. We started with somatostatin analogs, which often help. You've probably heard about that in some of your other sessions. But then we started embolizing because the biggest thing was to try and control the severe diarrhea that was causing a lot of dehydration and other serious problems. And after all of this, we had a lot of improvement. And with that improvement, her body was more stable, her, uh, the, her syndrome was much better. We went ahead and then took out the small bowel because eventually that might grow and give her more problems. And then, um, so we did very well after surgery, much safer than if we went in while she had full-on carcinoid syndrome. And then years later, she had an area of progression in the liver, which we then treated with a different kind of liver-directed therapy called ablation, which we don't have time for tonight, but it's where you put heat into only one part of the liver to destroy that. Same idea, you're destroying the tumor in place. So anyways, I hope between uh, Dr. Pasek and I hope we've gone over a lot. It is a lot to try and talk about in a short period of time. And we wanted to make sure there was some time for questions. But um, I think just the big principles are that, that liver directed therapies and surgeries should never be thought of in isolation. It should be used as part of an overall strategy. And, um, and I think that uh, uh, for all of you work with your team, make sure that we, all of these have been talked about, not just alone or as alternatives, but as what is the right combination, in which order, and over what time. So thank you for your attention. Sorry that uh, my camera's not working, for example, but thank you uh, for spending some time with Dr. Pasek and I tonight about these very interesting but complicated treatment uh, issues. Um, thank you. Uh, this is Lynn Gates again from the beginning, and I'd like to thank both of our presenters. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Um, I've had liver embolizations, and I never understood it as well as I did until tonight. So thank you very much. Um, I think we have some time for about maybe 10 minutes for some questions. Um, um, and I'm not sure if we've answered some of these. Um, how do you decide when to use surgery versus embolization versus other treatments? Does any um, Dr. Law or Dr. Pasika, would you like to speak to that? Chance we get start and I can add. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think uh, I think Calvin was trying to say that at the end, and that is that um, it's something that um, we, you know, there isn't one one uh, way fits all, and we're constantly trying to figure out what's the most significant problem you have. What is the uh, what do we need to deal with first? Is it the heart? Is it the carcinoid syndrome? Is it the bowel? And and we actually do have a strategy that goes into several different steps, but after each step, we have to revisit it again. How did you go through that? What kind of complications? What did we, what kind of benefit? And, and then we sometimes change that strategy again. Calvin? Yeah, I totally agree. I, you know, um, Dr. Masika, I always, sometimes I hate that answer a little bit, and I say it all the time, only because our patients think that we're trying to avoid telling them the plan, and it's not. It's because each of you are so unique, and, you know, it's strange. This is a relatively rare tumor, and yet we have more options in this than a lot of other more cam common cancers, but it complicates our life, and I think, you know, I know I've known Dr. Masika for years, and I can tell you how sincere she is about exploring all these options. We talk about it often at our meetings. There's no one right answer. Uh, there is an answer for you, but there's not one right answer that we can present. Now, I will say that what Dr. Kuziga just said is really important. What is your primary problem? Is it flushing that's so out of control you can't get out of the house? Is it diarrhea that's dehydrating you? Or are you vomiting because you're obstructed? All of those different things will prioritize one treatment over the other. Um, so I think that, uh, I think in general, uh, for, for the surgery, liver versus uh, embolization, I think the general principle is if you have larger metastases that are sort of localized in one area, that'd probably be more for surgery. If you have many spots spread more for, over your liver, it's not that surgery isn't possible, but I'm sure embolization will be more part of your discussion than it would be in the other scenario. Thank you. We've had a couple questions, um, Dr. Law, about bland versus uh, chemo embolization and when uh, when you choose one over the other, and I know you spoke to that a bit, but is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, let's see. If I don't really know what Calgary is doing. I'd be really interested. I think for us, I'd like to emphasize that the bland embolization versus chemo embolization is not, and for us, it's not really a, a one or the other. Embolization, uh, we're doing a trial right now because we're trying to determine if chemo embolization has longer lasting effects and if it's better versus side effects. And I think what, what we've tried to do is tell people that we don't have the answer. We, we appreciate those who are willing to undergo the trial with us. We know that embolization definitely works. And when we add chemoembolization, we feel like it's a reasonable option to give you because you are getting the component that we know works, which is the embolization. Whether the chemo particle itself helps, we don't know. That's why we uh, uh, wanted to be part of a trial, and that's why the trial is there to help us understand better. Uh, and certainly, uh, hopefully at the end of this trial, we can give you an answer. But that answer is likely gonna tell us which one to do rather than one versus another. So if chemoembolization is significantly better, we may see a shift in practice where we use more chemoembolization than bland embolization right now. Um, Dr. Kasik, any thoughts? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, we just we just uh, uh, focus on bland embolization. Um, haven't done very much chemo embolization, and as you said, because we don't know um, if it's that much better. Um, um, but the trial is going to be important. Uh, so that's fantastic that you're doing it, Cal uh, Dr. Law. Yeah. Then there's a question about uh, multiple liver sur surgeries. Can you have multiple liver surgeries? And then a uh, question about wedge resectioning. Dr. Pasika? Well, I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Lal to answer that. He's the, he's the hepatobiliary expert, so. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's funny. But uh, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, every subsequent operation you have is always going to be harder. Dr. Pasika knows that for sure. Um, and we'd like to try and maximize uh, what we get done at one surgery uh, uh, as a general principle. You can always go back in. Um, it is going to be harder. This is why the sequence is really important. So for example, some people we will embolize first because there are been many small spots that maybe we can never get to surgery. After the embolization, your body might tell us which one is a little bit more resistant. And if there was a time that we could go into surgery, 
then we could target those ones. Now we know which ones we would have to address. Now at the same time, back to, uh, back to something that Dr. Pasika said that was really important, if we're operating and your small bowel tumor, if that's where it started, is uh, resectable, then if I was working with Dr. Pasika, I would want her there to help me take that out at the same time as we do the liver, because if we can do it safely and carefully together as a team, we don't want to have to expose you to another surgery. Now, the second question you asked, I think is kind of important. Uh, it's something that Dr. Pasika showed a beautiful picture of, but it's hard to sort of explain. It's this question about wedge resection. Now, there are a lot of type, there's a lot of other kind of cancers where we take out a section of your liver. So, for example, the entire right side or the entire left side. The issue with neuroendocrine tumors is that it does tend to show up in more than just one section. And what we tend to try and do is remove just the tumors and not the whole section of your liver. Because remember I told you you can do those treatments in different orders? Well, sometimes after surgery, if some tumors were to come back, we might want to use embolization after surgery. And your ability to tolerate more embolizations are going to be a lot better if you have both sides of your liver in place than just one. So that's just some basic perspective. And now I'll ask Dr. Pasek if she has anything else too. No, oh, that's good. Sounds good. <laughs> um, just to sort of piggyback on that surgery question, um, why do they remove the gallbladder during net surgery? <laughs> the, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, the uh, somatostatin analogs that uh, almost always you're going to be on and probably for life um, will cause a slowing down and a dysfunction of the liver and that will uh, lead to making gallstones and if you've had major liver surgery and then you get a gallbladder uh, attack it's not as simple as a laparoscopic cholecystectomy so we're being um, you know proactive the other reason is with the embolization and embolizing the a liver that is near the gallbladder could cause some necrosis of the area and the gallbladder and then you have a very sick gallbladder and that is not related to the tumor. So um, that's why I do it. Um, Calvin, any? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's we don't want to take things out of you that you don't have to, but that gallbladder, I think Dr. Pasek has seen some like mine. Wow, some people who don't have their gallbladder taken out after a while with the therapy, it can be bad. It's like a bad kind of cholecystitis. It's not like the regular type we see. And the other, the other problem is we talked a little bit about before is that if we're doing liver surgery on you and everything else, but we leave your gallbladder behind, um, it's going to be very stuck. And if your gallbladder has a big problem later, it can be extremely difficult to get out at that time. And now you're exposing your patient to another operation. Now, I, we totally get it. We, you know, there's no operation that doesn't have side effects. We try to be thoughtful about it. But normally, your gallbladder gets removed uh, because um, overall, the uh, just from our experience, your overall journey is going to be easier without it than with it. I think the final thing, sorry if I missed that you said it there, I lost the audio for one second, but the other thing is when you embolize, you actually have a risk of killing off the gallbladder. So if you're planning embolizations later, because of the way the blood flows and sometimes the gallbladder is driving its blood supply right where you're about to embolize, then uh, you don't want that problem either because um, if the embolization and kills the gallbladder, it's great that you killed the tumor, but you've got another problem. And then all of a sudden you're going through emergency surgery again. So that was the only other thing I'd add. Uh, maybe we have time for one more question. Is that okay? We started a couple minutes sure. late. Um, um, what is cytoreduction and can it be used when tumors are throughout the whole liver? So I think I was using that term. Uh, so cytoreduction re means removing parts uh, uh, of the tumor, so decreasing the tumor. Um, and as opposed to us talking about formal uh, wedge resections or liver resections, um, when we're talking globally, how do we debulk or reduce the number of tumor cells you have? And so by subtle reducing, that could be removing the tumors, by embolizing, killing 
tumor cells, we cytoreduce. So it's just a term we use to say decrease the number of tumor cells. Okay. There's, there's just one more question here. Do the benefits of surgery outweigh the risks? Will I get new symptoms or side effects? Uh, and I think we've talked a little bit, a little bit about that, but if we could just take one more minute and then we'll close. Thank you so much. Anybody want to speak to that? Well, well, the benefits of surgery would have to outweigh the risks if the surgeon is recommending surgery. So uh, none of us would say, okay, here's an operation. Like we, we, we can operate on many people, but if the benefits of the surgery um, uh, are, or the side effects of the surgery or the morbidity are far greater, then we would be going down a different route and surgery would not be offered. So there's always going to be downside to every treatment we use. And that's why we'll explain this is the downside of the surgery. But if we are offering that and putting that as part of your treatment strategy, it's because we've weighed not doing surgery and trying plan B. This would be better, but it has a higher risk profile. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you both again. It was very informative and, and uh, I know that everyone appreciated and especially the time you took to answer the questions. So thank you to all the people who participated this evening and we look forward to our next webinar which we will be sending information out about soon. Thank you very much and good evening everybody. Thank you. Thanks stay safe much. everybody. Please stay, stay safe. safe. Yes for sure. Thank you. Take care.